So, um, so basis of the digestive system is this is a system that's going to be responsible for providing fuel for the body cells functioning. Uh, the digestive system will include the digestive tract or more commonly called the gastrointestinal tract or GI tract or alimentary canal. Um, they all have the same, um, they're all, those terms are all used interchangeably with each other. Uh, the GI tract is a muscular tube and it includes the oral cavity, uh, which is the mouth, the pharynx, the esophagus, the stomach, the small and large intestines, and then the re rectum and the anus. There are also various accessory structures uh, that contribute to digestion, which will include the teeth, tongue, salivary glands, gallbladder, liver, and pancreas. Now the functions of the digestive system, there are six key functions that are involved. The first is ingestion. This occurs when food and drink enter the mouth. Then you have mechanical processing. This is the physical crushing of solid food to make it easier to move along the digestive tract. Also increases the surface area for enzymes to be able to begin the digestive process. The process begins in the oral cavity with teeth and the tongue and it continues in the stomach and the small intestines. Digestion is the chemical breakdown of food to absorbable sizes. You also have secretion. This is the release of water, acids, enzymes, and buffers into the lumen of the digestive tract. Once everything gets broken down into basic macromolecules, then you have absorption. And this absorption is the movement of these small organic molecules quote unquote macromolecules, such as glucose, or not glucose, uh, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids, along with electrolytes and water across the digestive epithelium and into the intestinal fluid of the digestive tract. And then finally, we have defecation. This is the elimination of waste products from the digestive tract, and the products are ejected as feces at the end. So looking at the different components of the digestive system, uh, we have the major organs of the digestive tract where you have the oral cavity or mouth. Again, this is where ingestion, mechanical digestion with accessory organs of the teeth and tongue, the moistening and mixing with salivary secretions will occur. You then have the pharynx. This is really just a conduit uh, or a tube. It will pro you will have the muscular propulsion of materials into the esophagus from the pharynx. The esophagus, again, this is also just a tube or a conduit that will transport materials to the stomach. In the stomach, this is where you'll have chemical digestion of materials by acid and enzymes, the mechanical digestion through muscular contractions as well. You then have the small intestines. You will continue digestion in the first part of the small intestines uh, by enzymatic digestion. And then you will have absorption of water, organic substances, vitamins, and ions. When you get to the large intestines, there's no more digestion or absorption that's occurring as far as nutrients. The only thing that's being absorbed in the large intestines is water. And this is dehydration and compaction of anything that was indigestible materials, i.e. waste, in preparation for elimination from the body. There are various accessory organs that are associated with the digestive tract, the teeth this is, and tongue. This is gonna assist with mechanical digestion. Salivary glands, this helps to lubricate the food moving along the GI tract, as well as begin the breakdown chemically of carbohydrates. The liver will secrete bile, which is important for the emulsification or breakdown of lipids. The liver also functions as a storage of nutrients and many other vital uh, functions. The gallbladder, this will actually, uh, does not produce bile, but it stores bile that's produced by the liver and it concentrates bile. And finally, the pancreas, this has uh, both an endocrine and an exocrine function. When we talked about the endocrine system, it does release uh, insulin and Googlegon, which help to, uh, you know, Keep, keep track of uh, or keep our blood glucose levels intact. Uh, but the exocrine function does release pancreatic juice, which will really help to break down proteins. Now, looking at the digestive tract lining, 
Uh, this plays a defensive role for the body. It protects the surrounding tissues from corrosive effects of the digestive acids and enzymes, as well as physical abrasion and bacteria that are ingested or live within the digestive tract. There are four histological layers of the GI tract, uh, the mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis externa, and then finally the serosa. And by the way, the mucosa is the innermost layer, the serosa is the outermost layer. So looking at the mucosa, this is our mucous membrane, which is the lining of the digestive tract. It consists of mucosal epithelium, composed of stratified squamous epithelium, which is high mechanical stress areas. Uh, and then you also, in areas of the mucous membrane where you have high secretion areas, you'll see simple columnar epithelium. So the, 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 the epithelium does change. You'll also have an underlying layer of areolar tissue called the lamina propria. You'll have a smooth muscle layer called the muscularis mucosa. And then you'll have various modifications such as villi, glands, and folds, which will depend on the function. And here we can see the general structure of the mucosa layer right here. The submucosa, this is a layer of dense irregular connective tissue. It binds the mucosa to the muscle layer. It contains blood vessels and lymphatics. And the outer margin contains parasympathetic neurons and sensory neurons. They are called the submucosal plexus the neural network that can function without the CNS and it regulates secretion and motility. The muscularis layer, this is a band of smooth muscle arranged in an inner circular and outer longitudinal layer. It's involved in mixing and propelling materials. The myenteric plexus is between the layers of the muscle. It contains parasympathetic ganglia, sensory neurons, interneurons, and sympathetic postganglionic fibers. You will have both parasympathetic and sympathetic stimulation to regulate the activity of the muscular layer. The serosa and the adventitia. The serosa is a serous membrane covering the muscularis externa along the GI tract enclosed by the peritoneum, also called the visceral peritoneum. It is continuous with the parietal peritoneum, which lines the surface of the body wall from the stomach all the way down through the colon, ending before the rectum. Lines in the peritoneal cavity uh, is, it lines the peritoneal cavity in which most of the digestive organs will lie. We then have mesenteries. Mesenteries are double sheets of serous membrane, parietal and visceral peritoneum. Uh, they suspend portions of the digestive tract, particularly the small and large intestines. They also provide pathways for blood vessels, lymphatics, and nerves. They also help to organize and stabilize the attached organs. Now, movement of the digestive materials, um, you know, we have what are called pacesetter cells. These are very similar to the pacemaker cells of the heart. Uh, these are located in the smooth muscle of the digestive tract and they trigger contractions. Uh, peristalsis. Peristalsis is waves of contractions that are initiated by the circular layer, uh, followed by a longitudinal layer. This mechanism of movement helps to propel the bolus, which is the food mass when you swallow it, down the digestive tract. There is another mechanism of movement that we have in the GI tract, and that is called segmentation. With segmentation, this is a mixing action with no propulsion, churning, and breaking up of materials. So here we can see the mechanism of peristalsis where you have these wave-like contractions. Okay, you have the initial state here, you have the contraction, and then you have the contraction of longitudinal muscles and you sort of propel the bolus along. So let's look at the individual areas now, the GI tract. We'll start with the oral cavity. This is also called the buccal cavity. Um, it's part of the digestive tract that receives food. It is lined by the oral mucosa and lined with stratified squamous epithelium. It contains the tongue, teeth, and gingiva, which is your gums. Uh, it functions uh, in the fact that it senses food before swallowing. It mechanically processes food. 
It also lubricates food with saliva and mucus. And it begins the enzymatic breakdown or digestion of carbohydrates and lipids. And in case you didn't know what your oral cavity looked like, here it is. Uh, and you can see that here. So the lateral walls of the oral cavity are formed by the cheeks. This is supported by pads of fat and the mucinator muscle. Anteriorly, the mucosa is continuous with the labia. The roof is formed by the hard palate and the soft palate. The floor is dominated by the tongue. The free edge of the tongue is attached to the floor with the linguinal frenulum. And dividing the oral cavity from the nasopharynx is the uvula. This closes over the entry to the nasopharynx during swallowing. The tongue is skeletal muscle. It helps to manipulate food within the oral cavity. It mechanically compresses, abrades, distorts material. It assists in the chewing and preparing for food for swallowing. It provides sensory analysis of touch, temperature, and taste. And we have what's called the linguinal tonsils, which are paired lymphoid nodules at the base of the tongue. This helps to resist infection. The salivary glands, we have three pairs of glands that secrete into the oral cavity. There are three salivary glands, the parotid salivary gland, where the parotid duct enters into the area of the second upper molar right here. The sublingual salivary gland, this is on the floor of the mouth. And there are various uh, ducts releasing those secretions. Here's the sublingual salivary gland and submandibular is on the floor of the mouth on either side of the linguinal frenulum. So what is saliva? Saliva, uh, you produce about one to one and a half liters a day. During eating, production increases to about seven mils per minute and it's regulated by the autonomic nervous system. That's why if your fight or flight system kicks in, which is your sympathetic division, uh, you sort of get cotton mouth or dry mouth. The composition of saliva is 99.4% water. It does contain mucins, uh, which are digestive enzymes for bacteria. Uh, ions, pH buffers, waste products, metabolite, and various other enzymes that can help to uh, break down uh, food products. Now, the function of saliva is the water lubricates the mouth and it dissolves chemicals. The mucus reduces friction and makes swallowing easier. Buffers keep pH at near zero, I'm sorry, sorry near seven, uh, which is neutral. Uh, and it helps to pre prevent the buildup of acids produced by bacteria. Salivary antibodies such as IgA and lysozyme help to control bacterial levels. Salivary amylase, which is an enzyme, begins the chemical digestion of starches and we have uh, complex carbohydrates that will be produced. Uh, it's produced primarily by the parotid salivary gland and we have linguinal lipase, although in tiny amounts starts fat digestion. The teeth will perform chewing or mastication. Uh, and then you have various parts of the tooth here. I'm not too concerned that you know all the different parts of the tooth. Uh, and here are all of your teeth. You do not need to know all the different types of teeth that you have. Uh, you can get some tooth decay. Uh, this generally results uh, as a result of bacterial infections or bacterial action uh, due to plaque buildup. Um, and that can cause erosion of the teeth. Again, don't worry about the different types of teeth. Uh, just know that they're there for mechanical digestion. All right, the next structure is the pharynx. This is commonly called the throat. It serves as a common passageway for food, liquid, and air. Uh, food passes through the oral pharynx and laryngopharynx to the esophagus. The mucosa is stratified squamous epithelium. The lamina propria contains mucus glands and tonsils, and the pharyngeal muscles and esophageal muscles for swallowing. The esophagus, this is a passageway from the pharynx to the stomach. 
skeletal muscle that changes to smooth muscle about halfway down. Um, that's why you can sort of have control of the upper half of your esophagus, but the lower half is smooth muscle. You don't have conscious control over that. Uh, the lining is stratified squamous epithelium, uh, which helps to resist abrasion. Uh, it is about 25 centimeters long and about two centimeters wide. Um, it's located in the posterior to the trachea. Uh, it will enter into the abdominal cavity. It does have to pass through the diaphragm. And as it passes through the diaphragm, um, it will pass through the esophageal hiatus. Uh, diaphragmatic or hiatal hernias involve the movement of the abdominal organs upward through the esophageal hiatus. Uh, circular muscles at the either end of the upper and lower esophageal sphincters and the lower sphincter protects against gastric backflow. So you don't get essentially gastric contents, gastric contents being contents of the stomach um, sort of bubbling back up, okay? Not on a um, uh, normal basis, sorry. So the process of swallowing, uh, which is going to involve the, the, lar the pharynx uh, and uh, the esophagus, is a process called deglutination. It can be initiated voluntarily or involuntarily. Uh, it proceeds automatically once it has begun. So once you initiate it, it sort of follows through. The tongue forms the food into the bolus uh, or small mass. Uh, it then, you get compression of the bolus against the hard palate, which initiates the swallowing process. Uh, and here you can see the, the, the various phases. Uh, we have the buccal phase, um, which begins with the compression of the bolus against the hard palate, retraction of the tongue, and then forces the bolus into the oral pharynx. And this also assists in elevating the soft palate, thereby sealing off the nasopharynx so food doesn't go up to the uh, nostril area. In the pharyngeal phase, this begins as the bolus comes in contact with the uh, palatal arches and the posterior pharyngeal wall. Uh, elevation of the larynx and folding of the epiglottis direct the bolus down the glottis, which will lead into the esophagus and not into your trachea. The esophageal phase is now movement and contractions down into the esophagus, and then eventually the bolus will enter into the stomach. So here are those three phases. We have the buccal phase. It's a voluntary phase. It's the movement of the bolus back of the oral cavity into the oral pharynx. Uh, the soft palate closes off the nasopharynx. The pharyngeal phase, uh, the epiglottis folds over the larynx. Food and liquid are directed past the closed glottis. The uvula and the soft palate will block the nasopharynx. The esophageal phase, uh, the bolus is pushed uh, into the esophagus and towards the stomach. And then you have the pharyngeal and esophageal phases are involuntary. So this brings us to the stomach. There are four primary functions of the stomach. Temporary storage of ingested food, mechanical breakdown of ingested food, the chemical digestion by acids and enzymes, the production of intrinsic factor, which is actually needed for the absorption of vitamin B12. Chyme is now what the bolus is called once it enters into the stomach. Uh, it is highly acidic. Uh, and it contains partially digested food. The various regions of the stomach, it is a J-shaped organ with four margins. The cardia is where the esophagus connects. The fundus is a bulge of the stomach superior to the cardia. The body is a large area between the fundus and the curve of the J and of the stomach. And the pylorus is the most distal portion. It connects the stomach to the small intestines. You have the pyloric sphincter, which regulates the flow of chyme into the small intestines. Internal features of the stomach, uh, the ruga, these are rug folds of mucosa that are prominent when the stomach is empty and flatten when the stomach distends. The stomach can actually accommodate about one to one and a half liters. The muscularis externa has a circular longitudinal and third oblique layer. It strengthens the stomach wall, which also assists in mixing and churning. 
The mesenteries, you have the greater omentum, which extends from the stomach down over the abdominal viscera, and the lesser omentum, which extends from the stomach to the liver. And here you can see the structure or anatomy of the stomach. Now, one thing I wanna dive into a little bit is the gastric wall. It is lined with that of simple columnar epithelium with numerous mucus cells. And you're going to create a mucus epithelium. This secretes alkaline mucus that protects the epithelium. You have gastric pits. These are shallow depressions that open to the gastric surface. Mucus cells at the base or neck undergo active mitosis, replacing the mucosal cells every three to seven days. The gastric glands located in the fundus, body, and pylorus will extend deep from the gastric pits. The cells produce about one and a half liters per day of gastric juice. The parietal cells in the gastric glands, uh, first of all, you have uh, two primary cells that are part of the gastric glands. You have parietal cells. These secrete intrinsic factor for vitamin B12 absorption. They also produce hydrochloric acid. The hydrochloric acid will lower the pH of the gastric juice to about one and a half to two, which kills microorganisms and it activates enzymes. You then have chief cells, which secrete pepsinogen, which is activated by hydrochloric acid, which is converted into proteolytic enzyme called pepsin. In infants, it also secretes renin and gastric lipase that are important for the digestion of milk. And here we can see the regulation of gastric activity. There's three phases. Uh, we have the cephalic phase of uh, the gastric phase. And then we have the intestinal phase. During the cephalic phase of the gastric secretion begins when you, see, uh, when you see, smell, or taste, or think of food. This phase is directed by the parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system. It prepares the stomach to receive food. In response to stimulation, the production of gastric juice speeds up, reaching rates of about 500 mils per hour. During the gastric phase, this begins when food arrives in the stomach. The stimulation of the stretch receptors in the stomach wall and of chemoreceptors in the mucosa will trigger local reflexes in the submucosa and myenteric plexuses. This results in mixing waves from the muscular layer and the secretion of the mucus, pepsinogen, and hydrochloric acid. During the intestinal phase, the third phase, uh, the intestinal phase of the gastric secretion begins when chyme first enters into the duodenum of the small intestines. The function of the small intestine phase, uh, or the function of the intestinal phase, sorry, uh, is to control the rate of gastric emptying to ensure that the secretory, digestive, and absorptive functions of the small intestines can proceed. Now, the regulation of gastric activity, this is the production of acid and enzymes. It's controlled by the central nervous system. It's regulated by reflexes involving the stomach wall and it's regulated by hormones of the digestive tract. And as I just mentioned, it involves three phases. Those three phases, again, cephalic phase, I went over this, gastric phase, and the intestinal phase. Now, digestion in the stomach will occur by salivary amylase and lipases to stop, will stop functioning when the pH falls below five and a half. Uh, it's generally active for one to two hours after a meal. The pH inside the stomach will drop to two as more gastric juice is secreted. Pepsin initiates protein digestion to small peptides. Partially broken down nutrients will then start to leave the stomach and enter their way into the um, small intestines. No nutrients are absorbed in the stomach. The mucosa is covered in an alkaline mucus. This is really to protect the lining of the stomach so it doesn't eat itself from the acid. Epithelial cells lack transport mechanisms. Gastric lining is impermeable to water and digestion is complete. Nutrients are still complex. And I'm gonna stop right here for the first part of the recording. Uh, so right now where we're at is food has been broken down in the stomach. Uh, the food that has been broken down in the stomach is carbohydrates and uh, proteins. No lipids have been broken down. That will not occur until we get to the small intestines here. So this will end part one.